Welcome back. And we are now moving to the last session. because uh, it's a, uh, a special place uh, that, uh, where we have young uh, uh, economists presenting their work and also this year is the second year we do this uh, and uh, um, so we are especially attached to this. So we will have uh, three presenters. We will have uh, Lavinia Franco, then uh, we will have uh, Pascal Zeiler and then uh, we will have Piotr Sok. And uh, so we have 25 minutes for each presentation. Then after each presentation, we have uh, uh, some time for questions. So the floor is yours. So thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to present my work to this audience. Uh, this study, my study, is part of my PhD thesis, but since uh, I recently joined ECB, the usual disclaimers uh, apply. Um, so in this study, I study, uh, I look, explore the existence of a fintech lending channel of monetary policy. As you may know already, technology enabled innovations in financial services may include a wide range of innovations. And in this specific setting, I refer to, uh, fintech, uh, um, to fintech as online mortgage origination. Over the past few years, the share of fintech lending in the mortgage sector in the US has increased significantly. As an example here, I report on the left hand side, the share of fintech lending in the mortgage sector, in, in particular in the Federal Housing Administration segment, which has increased from about 3% in 2012 to about 15% in 2019. And we know very well that mortgages play a central role in the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So it is important to understand whether the transmission mechanism for fintech lending differs from the non-fintech one. And the number of fintech operators in the mortgage sector in the US um, are still rather limited. I report here on the right hand side, uh, the top mortgage orig originators in 2022 in the US and uh, the fintech are reported in bold. So uh, even if the number is rather limited, as you can see, uh, some of them account for a sizable portion of the overall mortgage market. Indeed, in 2022, the largest mortgage originator was a fintech lender, Rocket Mortgage, and uh, other fintech lenders such as Loan Depot and Guaranteed Rate also account for a, a quite uh, large share. So, I'm interested in this work in looking on how does the transmission mechanism monetary policy work through fintech, whether it differs from the non-fintech one, and also since uh, fintech lenders are usually uh, non-banks, I'm interested in the differences between fintech and non-fintech non-banks in transmitting monetary policy. So very briefly on the literature, my work contributes to this literature on the role of technology mortgage lending, uh, in particular, Fuster et al. 2019, they showed that uh, um, fintech lenders process mortgage application 20% faster compared to non-fintech. And the authors assert that this faster origination process may facilitate the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So I contribute to this literature by testing empirically this prediction in the US mortgage market. And then there is a growing literature on the transmission mechanism of monetary policy via non-banks. Uh, in particular, the, work by, the works by Elliot uh, et al. 2022 and Xiao 2019, they show that in times of contractionary monetary policy, non-banks tend to receive a large amount of funding. And they show that uh, uh, this large amount of funding allowed them uh, to be in a better position to provide credit to the real economy uh, compared to traditional banks in times of uh, contractionary monetary policy. So I contribute to this literature by looking specifically at the fintech segment within the non-banks sector. And also there is a very re recent and interesting paper by Erel et al. 2024 that they look at uh, the monetary policy uh, transmission uh, through uh, online banks uh, and they show that uh, when the Fed fund rate uh, increase, uh, uh, the deposit rate offered by online banks uh, tend to increase more compared to the one of traditional banks. So my work is complementary to the one of them because I focus on uh, the asset side of non-banks while they look at the liability side of uh, regulated uh, digital banks. 
So, in terms of fintech definition, I rely, I rely on uh, the work uh, by Buchak et al. 2018 and Fuster et al. 2019, that they both define fintech lenders uh, as those companies that uh, offer an almost entirely digital loan application process. So in other words, the borrowers uh, are offered with this uh, uh, digital loan application process and they will meet with a loan officer at a very late stage of the process, so usually at closing. And uh, in my sample period, fintech lenders are all non-depository institutions, so non-banks, uh, in particular mortgage companies. But uh, towards the end of the decade, uh, um, also some traditional banks started to offer uh, online banks uh, mortgage origination. So in future extensions of this work, it will be interesting to see uh, what happens to, in this case, a replicate analysis to fintech banks uh, too. So how these fintech lenders uh, look like. Uh, I exploit uh, a new source of information to gain insight uh, on uh, fintech uh, uh, lenders' uh, activities. Uh, I exploit, uh, uh, in particular, non-bank reports, uh, because since 2011, non-banks that conduct mortgage origination in the US need, need to file core reports on a quarterly basis. So following young 2019, I submitted a freedom of information request to uh, several state regulators and obtained the data. And these non-bank score reports, uh, they offer us uh, a very previous insight on non-banks activities that was undisclosed until a few years ago. So indeed, these core reports, they include granular information uh, on non-banks income statement and balance sheet, such as uh, source of asset, uh, source of capital, asset, and also information on the warehouse credit lines. And so for the first time, I use this data um, to account for differences between fintech and non-fintech uh, uh, non-banks uh, in the monetary policy transmission mechanism. From this data, we can already sketch a, a couple of graphs. Uh, for instance, here I report uh, um, uh, the, the, the amount, the percentage of technology-related expenses as a share of total operating cost. And as one could expect, uh, fintech lenders have a higher technology-related expenses. And also, fintech lenders have a lower average origination cost. Here I report the average personal compensation per loan originated, which is about 1,000, 2,000 lower for fintech lenders compared to non-fintech. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, consistent with the more automated approach that these fintech lenders have in place. So now that we have looked at some of these, some of the fintech data and some very basic characteristics of these lenders, let's go back to the research questions. And think, let's think about why the transmission mechanism for fintech may differ. It first may differ for technology, since uh, fintech lenders uh, uh, use an automated screening approach, they process mortgage application faster, so we can think uh, that this could facilitate the transmission mechanism of monetary policy uh, to mortgage rates and volumes. And this is specific to fintech non-banks, and is something that differentiates them from both non-fintech non-banks and traditional lenders. And the second reason why the transmission channel may differ is the funding structure. Uh, usually, fintech lenders are non-depository institutions with a, a short-term uh, base funding structure, and this could reduce the sensitivity of fintech credit to monetary policy development, uh, since the availability of, uh, of funding tend to increase in times of contractionary monetary policy. And it has been shown in the literature that this can lead to a substitution effect in the supply of credit from banks to non-banks, of which uh, uh, fintech are a subgroup. And uh, while the technology is specific uh, uh, to fintech, um, the, um, the funding structure is specific to both fintech uh, non-banks and non-fintech non-banks. Uh, so to better isolate uh, the effect of the monetary policy transmission on fintech lenders, uh, for today's presentation, I will focus my analysis on the comparison on the monetary policy transmission uh, through fintech versus other non-fintech non-banks lenders. So what I do in this paper, I use loan level data and non-bank score reports uh, to study the effect of conventional and conventional monetary policy shocks uh, on uh, uh, mortgage rates and volumes uh, in the US between 2012 and 2019. 
I find that uh, fintech lenders lessen the, the transmission mechanism monetary policy to mortgage volumes, while they tend to um, accelerate the pass-through to mortgage rates. Importantly, I find that the differences seem to be related to the speed of the pass-through rather than to the cumulative size, which is studies comparable between fintech and non-fintech over the medium term. And given this, and given the fact that uh, I cannot explain the differences uh, that I find uh, using uh, lender's characteristics, borrower characteristics, I conclude that the fintech lending channel is likely driven by the technological advancement that distinguish fintech lenders from other credit providers. Um, so before proceeding to the data model, I will just show you briefly uh, how, how it works, the peculiarity of the non-bank's mortgage origination process uh, in the US, uh, since this may also be useful for the monetary policy uh, assessment. Um, so we can think of a borrower that uh, at time zero applies for a mortgage to a non-bank lender Y, that can be either a fintech or a non-fintech uh, non-banks. And if the application is successful, in the following period, uh, the non-bank lender will issue the loan and uh, will approve and issue the loan, and uh, the borrower is, will receive the funds. And uh, what is the peculiarity here is on how um, the non-bank lender uh, get funded. So we know that uh, uh, the uh, bank, the funding, hist the core hi funding instrument of traditional banks are retail deposits. While non banks uh, to obtain funding, uh, they need to re rely on warehouse credit lines uh, that are usually credit lines that they have with either uh, investment banks or commercial banks. So to originate the mortgage, they will uh, draw from the available credit lines and they will use uh, uh, the mortgage as collateral. And then in the following period, uh, usually within three months, they will sell the loan to mortgage investors and the funds will go back to the warehouse lender. So I'm interested in the monetary policy transmission uh, to the mortgage rates and volumes, but in my model, I also want to control for the funding condition of the non-bank lender since they may matter in the monetary policy transmission channel. So I use a, a variety of, uh, of data. I use uh, loan-level data from uh, the Federal Housing Administration. I complement that uh, with uh, borrower-level data from uh, the HMBA, uh, non-bank report for or lender-level data, and I use the monetary policy shocks uh, proposed by Bauer Swanson 2022. So very briefly on the Federal Housing Administration data, this data come from the US Department uh, for housing urban developments uh, that publishes data on a monthly frequency. Uh, my sample includes 2.5 million fixed rate mortgages. And to give you an idea, the Federal Housing Administration segment uh, over the period that I'm considering accounted for about 20% of the overall mortgage market in the US. And of this 20%, non-banks originated up to 75%. And the federal housing program uh, in the US is a program that is addressed to borrowers that have a weak credit history and that can put a small down payment. And from this data set, I collect information on uh, the interest rate, the amount of the loan, and also on the location of the property. On the borrower level data, I will just show you the uh, borrower income, which is uh, very similar between fintech and non-fintech, but also if we look at other characteristics at borrower level, they also do not show uh, statistical relevant uh, uh, differences. Um, from, for the non-lender level data, uh, as I mentioned before, I use the non-bank score report. Uh, I uh, show you before some uh, cost-related expenses charts. Here instead, uh, um, I would like just to show some capital liquidity ratio and uh, uh, warehouse, uh, uh, warehouse funding conditions. So if we just look, for instance, at the equity over total asset uh, as a measure of capital and the short term, asset over short liability liabilities as a measure of liquidity, uh, they both look, look very similar between fintech and non-fintech. Instead, uh, uh, the credit line's interest rate, uh, so the, the interest rate that they pay on the short-term debt that I estimated from, from the data, uh, seems to be 10, 10 basis points lower for fintech compared to non-fintech. So these are just some statistics. Uh, I will include this uh, uh, information in uh, my uh, regression model. Finally, in terms of uh, data, I use uh, uh, the monetary policy shocks uh, proposed by 
Bauer is 1 to 2022, uh, since I needed a measure that was exogenous to non monetary policy related factors, but also a measure that was capturing the unconventional monetary policy tools that has been largely utilized uh, recently. Uh, so my main variable of interest is the so-called target path uh, uh, series, which capture unexpected changes in the monetary in the um, in the policy rate and on the expected path of the federal fund rate over the next several months. That is the the four guidance. Um, so starting with the baseline model results. So I estimated the, the responses of fintech and non-fintech lending to monetary policy shocks using regression analysis. All uh, mm, regression models uh, are estimated in changes uh, with quarterly frequency. And since uh, uh, these are mortgages, I cannot observe the same, uh, um, the same borrower over time. So I aggregate data at lender county quarter level. And the dependent variable is either uh, the, um, the average lending rate or the log of volumes, estimated as a function of the monetary policy shocks and of the monetary policy shocks interacted with a fintech dummy. And then uh, I have a series of uh, controls and uh, I saturate the model with uh, um, fixed effects. Um, so starting from, uh, um, starting from the volumes, uh, the interaction of uh, the monetary policy variable with the fintech dummy is positive and statistically significant, indicating that uh, fintech reduced the monetary policy transmission uh, to mortgage volumes. And this results remain significant across uh, different specifications, also when I include uh, lender uh, level fixed effect to control for time invariant characteristics at lender level and county time fixed effect to control for time variant characteristics at county level. And then I exclude uh, um, in the next table the largest fintech lender because I wanted to be sure that the results were not driven by just this large lender uh, that is active in the US. And the results uh, remain um, significant across the different specifications. So in general, this results is consistent with literature that shows that uh, um, non-banks tend to provide more credit in times uh, relatively to banks in times of uh, contractionary monetary policy. Uh, cycles, and this seems to be particularly true for uh, fintech uh, non-banks. Moving then to the interest rate, uh, um, I find that the pass-through of the monetary policy is stronger for fintech, uh, more to fi for fintech mortgage rates, so for uh, 100 basis point uh, uh, tightening in monetary policy, um, fintech lenders increase uh, the interest rate to borrowers by an additional 14 basis point compared to non-fintech uh, lenders. Uh, but these results lose, lose significance when I include uh, the various uh, fixed effect. However, they do gain uh, significance when uh, um, I exclude the largest fintech lenders. So this seems to suggest that not for all fintech lenders, but for most of them, uh, the pass-through of monetary policy uh, to lending rates uh, is, uh, is faster. And this will be consistent with the fact that uh, uh, technology can facilitate uh, uh, the monetary policy transmission mechanism. So I will just uh, show you three additional uh, controls uh, tests. So the first one uh, I had uh, the lender level controls variables uh, from the non-bank score reports uh, because uh, I want to see whether uh, uh, the characteristics at lender level can explain the differences that I find between fintech and non-fintech. So I had uh, uh, measures of capital and uh, liquidity and I had also uh, a measure of uh, the cost of funding that they, these uh, non-bank lenders uh, pay on their short-term debt. And in general, adding all these uh, uh, variables um, does not alter uh, the main results that I showed you before, neither not for the lending volumes, uh, neither for uh, the lending rates. Then I will do uh, a second test uh, that is uh, looking at the flow of funds to lenders. Because previous studies shows that in times of contractionary monetary policy, there is this flow of funds that goes from banks to non-banks. So since I find that uh, uh, fintech lenders uh, 
are even better able to provide credit uh, compared to other uh, non-banks, I want to see whether this is possible because they receive an additional flow of funds compared to other uh, non-banks. Um, so I uh, regress uh, the short-term debt of, uh, of uh, um, fintech and non-fintech non-banks on the monetary policy shocks uh, um, and as a number of, uh, of controls. Uh, again, exploiting the novel granular data set at uh, non-banks uh, uh, level that I, I obtained. And here I find that consistent with the literature, uh, I find that the short-term funding of non-bank lender tend indeed to increase following a tightening in monetary policy, but I do not find differences between fintech and non-fintech lenders. So this again, um, this suggests that the main regression results that I showed you before are not driven by differences in the funding flows uh, um, to fintech lenders. And then finally, I'm interested in the dynamic responses of uh, market rates uh, and volumes uh, because I want to see, I want to verify whether uh, the fintech lending channel is, is driven by uh, a different distribution of the pass-through over time, potentially due to the technological advancement of this fintech lender, or whether it is due to uh, a, dif um, a different cumulative size of the pass-through, uh, potentially due to, to some more structural causes. So I use uh, uh, panel local projections to assess the dynamic responses of fintech and non-fintech uh, um, uh, mortgage rates and volumes uh, to monetary policy shocks. And uh, um, the charts that I report here uh, represent uh, uh, the differences in the impulse responses for fintech versus non-fintech lenders. On the left hand side, the lending rates, on the right hand side, the lending volumes. So if we look, for instance, at the left hand side, we see that uh, there is a positive significant coefficient with one quarter lag between fintech and non-fintech, which confirms the, res the result obtained from the static model. But then as uh, we progress to the other quarters, uh, uh, these uh, differences uh, tend to, to vanish. And the same uh, applies to, to the lending volumes. So it seems that uh, the differences that I find between fintech and non-fintech seem more related to the speed rather than to a, a, um, to a cum different cumulative size uh, over time. Um, so just to sum up, I investigated the effect of uh, um, monetary policy shocks on mortgage rates and volumes in the US. I find that fintech tend to reduce the transmission mechanism of monetary policy to mortgage volumes, while they tend to, uh, so sorry, they, yes, they reduce, while they tend to, uh, there are some evidence that they tend to accelerate the pass-through to mortgage rates. As I John mentioned, these uh, differences seem to be related more to the speed rather than to a different cumulative size. And uh, since I control for different characteristics at borrower level, at lender level, at time, um, at, at geographical level, uh, and I, the results are still there, I conclude that the fintech lending channel is likely driven by this technological advancement uh, that distinguish fintech lenders. So what in terms of policy implication? I think there is one main policy implication of my paper, that is the fact that uh, it is true that uh, the monetary policy transmission to fintech rates is faster in certain cases, but the impact on, uh, on mortgage volumes come with a delay. Uh, so um, the monetary policy implication is that monetary policy lags may be longer with, uh, with fintech. And in terms of future extensions, I think it will be interesting to explore new data sources uh, um, for fintech. Also, it will be interesting to extend analysis to, to the broader uh, mortgage market in the US. And in Europe, where uh, um, banks dominate in providing mortgages to households, I think that it will be interesting, for instance, to look at, uh, uh, to classify uh, banks, uh, online banks, uh, based on the way that uh, they provide mortgages uh, and replicate analysis. And then finally, I think it will be interesting to evaluate the uh, financial stability implication of uh, these uh, um, innovative forms of lending. Thank you. I am looking forward to your comments. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Lavinia. It was uh, very interesting and, uh, and super timely. And uh, so let's open the floor for a few questions. Uh, we have uh, here Wolfgang. Yeah, I think this was very interesting um, because I was not aware of, of this particular type of, I knew it existed, but was a very insightful deep dive into this. So that also is my question about to enhance a bit further <laughs> the knowledge. So you showed this chart that the um, technolo technological expenditure over all expenditure for fintech versus non-fintech. Your The last bar, bar pair showed they have converged. So, but also your broader knowledge of the industry, can we see that that they converge to a large extent, so the way that also traditional banks land, and do you expect then your, say, effect uh, to vanish? Also, are there, like, really technically speaking, are there traditional banks that do fintech lending? I haven't uh, seen this, but that would be just interesting. And then, of course, an, an obvious question. Any, any insights already? You had it on your list of to-dos, but uh, how this industry is doing in Europe or in the Euro area? Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for, uh, for the questions. So e indeed they are, I think there is a convergence. So it will be very interesting to expand uh, the sample to, with, uh, with, to the COVID period, because in that moment also, they already started a little bit before, but in particular during COVID, uh, traditional banks also started to offer more uh, digital services. And uh, um, I saw a report uh, recently on the US mortgage market that was saying that also, yeah, traditional banks are investing a lot uh, in, uh, in, in digitalization to reduce the cost of uh, originating because uh, we have seen that it's a bit higher, the cost uh, per loan originated for uh, non-fintech, and uh, they really saw that uh, investing in technology can reduce the cost. So there is uh, a convergence both in terms of what in their investment, but also in terms of uh, the way that they are offering uh, um, loan applications. And in terms of uh, the Eurozone, so I think the, the, um, here the, the market is, uh, of course, very, very different. Uh, the um, money market fund play less of a role, and in general, non banks uh, don't play a relevant role in uh, providing mortgages. But I think what, is, what we are observing is that uh, traditional banks, has, again in the US recently, are starting to offer a um, digital loan application process. So I think this is, is interesting to assess, will be interesting to assess whether this uh, uh, can uh, have a different effect on the transmission mechanism monetary policy compared to the loans, to the mortgages that are provided by going to a bank branch. We have other questions here. Um, sorry, maybe you went through this and maybe I missed it, but uh, at some point you talked about borrower characteristics. And one thing I was thinking about while you were going through the presentation is why would somebody accept a higher interest rate? Perhaps because the applications process faster, but then the question I had was, uh, isn't this a sign that perhaps there is some sorting when there is a monetary policy tightening that riskier borrowers go to fintech lenders versus non-fintech lenders. Um, maybe you touched upon this, but I have missed it. Thank you. So thank you, no, it's, that's a very important point. So I, I try to control for the riskiness of the borrower, both looking at the average income of the borrower and the loan to value ratio. Um, and I don't do that, but in a paper that use very similar data, they show that uh, there is, is it's a matter more of preference. So some uh, um, fintech borrowers, uh, they accept uh, a higher rates because they value convenience rather than cost saving. So they're not necessarily uh, riskier borrowers, uh, but uh, they may have this uh, preference. Carlo. No, oh, thanks, Lavinia. Very interesting. I was thinking whether the different uh, in the difference in the pricing of loans uh, might be due to the absence of a relationship banking, if you want, with fintech. So the absence of a relationship with the borrower maybe might create uh, a difference in pricing that would emerge then in your. Um, yes, it's something maybe I'm I, not sure I can, how I can control. Uh, for that, um, I have to think about this, but I, it may play, yes, it may play a role. Thank you. Giacomo. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> Uh, from your initial table, if I'm not mistaken, you had uh, these fintech lenders, and some of them are uh, traditional lenders, like, uh, I don't know, Wells Fargo or uh, JP Morgan, I saw. Uh, is there any difference in which the fintech branch of those banks uh, behave relative uh, to traditional uh, JP Morgan or Wells Fargo in ways that differ from your average? Or is it like... Uh, the fact of having a branch in the fintech is changing also the way in which the traditional branch is behaving, like internal competition, technological internal spillovers or something like that. No, sorry, maybe it wasn't super clear the first, uh, the first chart, the first table, because there I was indicating the one in bold were the fintech lenders, but Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, the other one are classified as traditional. But it would be interesting to look at something I don't do, to look at the branches of these traditional, that they are more digitalized, whether there are differences there in the monetary policy transmission. So we are already a bit over time, uh, so we show the interest in the paper. So thanks a lot. And let's move to the second paper uh, by Pascal Zeiter. And uh, so you have 25 minutes. Oh, it's there, the, the clicker. <laughs> Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I'm honored to have been selected for the Young Economist session at this great conference and to have the opportunity to present my paper called Nonlinearities of Monetary Policy Across States of Price Rigidity. This paper presents an empirical analysis that examines the, how the effects of monetary policy on macroeconomic outcomes vary as a function of price rigidity. By uncovering differential effects across states of flexible and rigid price adjustments, it highlights the dependence of monetary policy on the underlying price setting behavior of firms. This finding suggests that the timing and the economic context significantly influence policy outcomes. The starting point of this analysis is a broad consensus in the literature on whether and to what extent monetary policy matters for the real economy. Numerous empirical studies have shown that monetary policy has real effects with output declining in response to contractionary monetary policy shocks. Moreover, this output response is delayed, or reaching its trough with a certain lag of about six to eight quarters, depending on the study, and it is persistent. To explain why monetary policy has these real effects, standard economic models usually assume some form of constant nominal price rigidity. So for example, prices are assumed to be uniformly staggered or subject to change with a constant probability at any point in time. What I want to emphasize here is that uh, th this assumption of these, co these constant uh, price rigidities. While this is a convenient simplification for solving our models, it, it may, however, not accurately reflect reality. In particular, the frequency of price changes it is not necessarily uniform over time. For one, um, the frequency uh, with which firms change their prices may exhibit cyclical patterns with price changes occurring more frequently during certain phases of the business cycle or during, during different periods of inflation. For another, the frequency of price changes may exhibit seasonal patterns driven by wage setting patterns or the occurrence of seasonal sales or product life cycles. If price adjustments occur more frequently at certain times than others, then the effects of monetary policy as well may vary over time. All else being equal, monetary policy should have a smaller real effect during periods of lower price rigidity, that is when the frequency of price changes is higher. This paper examines how the effects of monetary policy differ across such states of price rigidity. And to do so, it proceeds in two steps. First, it estimates price rigidity in micro price data 
In particular, I calculate the frequency of price changes in the microdata underlying the consumer price index in the United Kingdom from 1996 to 2023. This allows me to identify states of more flexible and rigid price adjustment, which will then be used in the second step of the analysis. Because in the second step, the paper analyzes the differential effects of monetary policy shocks across states of these flexible and rigid price adjustment. In particular, I estimate nonlinear impulse responses to monetary policy shocks using local projections. And then I inform the model about these states of flexible and rigid prices using the frequency of price changes calculated from the microdata. And, I inform them, uh, and then I model the transition between states using a smooth transition function. This allows me to separate the data into two regimes and estimate impulse responses of, say, economic activity and prices um, to monetary policy shocks when price adjustments are frequent and when they are not. To preview my main results, I would like to relate them to the existing literature and thus highlight the contribution of the paper. The paper contributes to the literature by, com by combining two different strands. The first strand concerns the variability of price rigidity over time, which has been documented in the context of both uh, business cycles and inflation. The frequency of price changes has been shown to be counter-cyclical, increasing during recessions. There is also widespread evidence that the frequency of price changes increases in high inflationary periods, and this evidence is growing rapidly in the context of the, the recent post-pandemic inflation surge. By uncovering uh, the same patterns in the UK CPI microdata, I complement this strand of research with evidence from uh, the United Kingdom. The second strand concerns the state-dependent effects of monetary policy. The literature has analyzed a wide array of different st uh, states, uh, including also business cycles and inflation. While evidence is mixed regarding whether monetary policy is more effective during recessions or expansions, the evidence on inflation is more consistent. Several studies find that um, uh, in high inflation regimes, inflation responds more strongly to monetary policy shocks, while the real effects are more subdued. My results contribute to this research by showing that monetary policy has nonlinear effects depending on the degree of price rigidity. Specifically, I find that during periods of rigid prices, economic activity contracts more strongly to monetary policy shocks, while prices react much more slowly compared to periods of more flexible price adjustment. In doing so, my approach combines the strand of research on price rigidity with the strand of uh, analyzing the state-dependent monetary policy effects, offering a unified explanation of how these uh, uh, effects operate across recessions and inflationary environments through the underlying price setting mechanism. Given that the frequency of price changes tends to rise in inflationary periods and during recessions, my findings align with the view that the real effects uh, of monetary policy are weaker both in recessions and in high inflation environments. Thus, by integrating these two strands of research, my paper provides a micro foundation for the state dependent effects of monetary policy in the underlying price setting mechanism. In what follows, I will now go through the paper in more detail, uh, starting with the empirical evidence on the non uniformity of price rigidity over time. The data I use to analyze price rigidity are the microdata underlying the consumer price index in the United Kingdom. This is a very granular data set of more than 30 million price quotes across 1,300 different uh, distinct items of the basket of goods and services. After excluding administered prices, prices based on unit value indices and others, my sample covers more than 60% of total CPI expenditure. The data are monthly and span a period of 28 years in total from January 1996 to December 2023. Furthermore, um, the data contain extensive information on the types of price quotes, 
including temporary sales and product substitutions. The treatment of price changes due to sales and substitutions is crucial when measuring price rigidity. In the baseline sample, I include price changes due to both uh, in order to capture all price changes relevant to the CPI when uh, analyzing the differential effects of monetary policy. However, since both temporary sales and product substitutions can exhibit uh, cyclical and seasonal patterns, I complement the analysis of the non-uniformity of price rigidity over time net of these two effects. Finally, I estimate price rigidity by calculating the monthly frequency of price changes, which captures the share of prices that change in a given month. And this figure shows this monthly frequency of price changes uh, in the UK from 1996 to 2023. The raw series exhibits strong seasonal, uh, strong high frequency movements, many of which are uh, related to seasonal patterns. So to focus on the low frequency movements in price rigidity, I add the 12 month moving centered average uh, of the series to the figure. Clearly the frequency of price changes is far from constant over time. It was around 12% at the beginning of the sample, fell to below 10% after the millennium, increased again to uh, 14% in 2009 and 2011, declined again over the last decade before finally increasing to uh, above 17% most recently um, during, uh, after the pandemic. Some of these movements appear to be related to different measures of the business cycles, uh, uh, such as the unemployment rate. The share of consumer price changes moves closely with the unemployment rate and rises as the economy is slowing down. Uh, therefore, the frequency of price changes is countercyclical. The frequency of price changes also moves together with inflation, most notably during the uh, post-pandemic inflation surge. A one percentage point increase in inflation is associated with a 0.8 percentage point higher frequency of price changes. Both relations of the frequency with uh, the business cycle in indicators and inflation prove to be statistically significant and robust to different specifications in regression analysis. The empirical evidence thus shows that price setting is not uniform over time. Over time. Price rigidity exhibits large movements at business cycle frequencies and it varies with inflation. Next, I present the econometric method used to study the differential effects of monetary policy in periods of more flexible and more rigid price adjustment. It is based on the estimation of nonlinear impulse responses of macroeconomic outcome variables to monetary policy shocks using local projections. Local projections are an increasingly popular tool uh, in the applied literature for computing impulse responses as they're comparatively easy to compute. We simply run a set of OLS regressions, uh, one for each horizon of interest. And their easy computability scales in particular to their nonlinear extension, which provides a framework for estimating state dependent impulse response functions. This is done by regressing the macroeconomic outcome variable of interest, Y, on uh, the measure of monetary policy shocks, E, uh, interacted with a state indicator, the Z. And to identify these regimes of flexible and rigid price adjustment, and to inform the model about these states of price rigidity, I use the frequency of price changes calculated from the microdata as the state variable. And to smooth out these high frequency movements that we saw earlier, and to focus on these lower frequency movements in price rigidity, I use the 12 month centered moving average of the series. Finally, to, re to restrict this uh, state variable to the unit interval, I employ the logistic function um, uh, to, to smooth the transitions between states. Since this logistic function f of z is decreasing in z, values of f of z close to zero indicate the uh, flexible price adjustment states. So this is why um, the coefficients of interests, the betas, in the equation above, in the first term, identify the rigid price uh, setting regime, and in the second term, the uh, flexible price setting regime.
Now, this econometric setup relies on the assumption that the frequency of price changes that identifies these states of price rigidity um, is exogenous. Endogeneity is a potentially significant concern in this framework if the frequency of price adjustments responds to the monetary policy shocks. In the paper, I discuss two arguments to mitigate these concerns. The first relies on previous studies that uh, explore how the margins of price adjustment, the frequency and the size of price changes, uh, shape the response of inflation to, mon to, to aggregate shocks. And these studies agree that firms respond to monetary policy shocks by adjusting the size, but not the frequency of their price changes. And the authors conclude that aggregate shocks are too small compared to firm-specific shocks to be the main motif for price adjustment, and that hence idiosyncratic shocks matter more for firms' pricing decisions than aggregate shocks such as monetary policy shocks. The second argument presents a test for the exogeneity of the frequency of price changes in my very own data and setup. For that purpose, I use linear local projections and regress the frequency of price changes on the monetary policy shocks. And these estimation results suggest that also in my setup, the frequency of price changes remains unaffected by the monetary policy shocks. This mitigates endogeneity concerns and validates the frequency as a viable state variable. I then estimate the local projections using monthly data that span from uh, 1997 to 2023. The baseline specification follows a standard monetary VAR model that I choose to be as parsimonious as possible in order to capture the main transmission channel of monetary policy. The endogenous variables include real GDP, the consumer price index, excluding owner occupies housing costs, and the policy rate of the Bank of England, the bank rate. To avoid estimating a negative inflation response to policy rate cuts, that is the price puzzle, I follow the literature and also include uh, a commodity price index in US dollars as an exogenous forward-looking variable. And to convert this index into uh, sterling, I also include the nominal exchange rate between the US and the, the British pound. I borrow the monetary policy shocks from the UK monetary policy event study database provided by Brown and co-authors. This is a rich data set of intraday monetary policy surprises that capture high frequency revisions in, uh, in a wide range of assets around monetary policy events in the United Kingdom. Furthermore, they summarize monetary policy surprises into monetary policy factors that capture market reactions at, um, to monetary policy decisions at different points of the maturity structure. In the baseline model, I use the so-called path factor that summarizes anticipated monetary policy changes at the medium end of the maturity structure. This is motivated by the fact that um, during a substantial period of my sample, the bank rate was constrained by the effective lower bound and monetary policy operated through unconventional measures aimed at influencing rates expectations at longer maturities. And this path factor captures such unconventional measures. Finally, I rescale um, the monetary policy shocks uh, to raise the bank rate by 100 basis points after converting them from uh, a daily series around monetary policy event days into monthly averages uh, following uh, Gertrand Karadi. With that, we can turn to the main results. And I start by estimating the linear version of the local projection model to validate the overall empirical specification. Now, these figures show the coefficients from estimating the linear, linear model for each response variable. Real GDP on the left, the consumer price index in the middle, and the bank rate on the right. The impulse responses exhibit typical and well-documented features. The monetary policy shock is contractionary and uh, corresponds to a positive surprise in the bank rate of 100 basis points. Its positive and persistent effect on the bank rate induces a delayed um, uh, but statistically significant contraction in output. GDP starts to decline 
uh, one year after the initial shock and reaches its minimum after three years when it contracts by almost 2%. The initial response of consumer prices is muted, after which uh, inflation falls significantly and persistently in line with the decline in economic activity. After four years, it uh, uh, declines by 0.7%. Having established that the responses of the macroeconomic outcome variables um, to the monetary policy shocks in my econometric setup are consistent with the conventional wisdom, I now turn to the nonlinear extension of the analysis. The following figures show the estimation results of the nonlinear model, starting with the flexible price setting regime. The figures show the impulse responses of GDP on the top and the CPI at the bottom, following a contraction in monetary policy shock when price adjustments are frequent. When price adjustments are frequent, economic activity shows no significant response at all. At the same time, prices respond very quickly and fall after just one year. This contrasts with, with the response uh, of the same macroeconomic variables to monetary policy shock in the rigid price setting regime. When price adjustments are rigid, economic activity exhibits the usual hump shaped dynamics. After initial but insignificant increase, output declines significantly six to eight quarters after the initial shock. Moreover, prices react only sluggishly and fall after three years under the rigid price setting regi regime. In sum, I find evidence that flexible and rigid price adjustment regimes, as identified by the micro-founded frequency of price changes, affect the impact of monetary policy on output and prices differently. The results show that economic activity only contracts uh, under rigid price adjustment after a monetary policy shock. Moreover, prices decline faster and more persistently under the flexible price adjustment regimes. Compared with linear local projections, the effect of a monetary policy shock is amplified by a factor of up to three for both variables. In the case of economic activity under rigid price adjustment and in the case of prices under flexible price adjustment. I assess the sensitivity of these main results in a comprehensive set of robustness exercises. In particular, I perform additional tests regarding the identification of both the regimes and the monetary policy shocks used in the local projections model. For example, I assess the sensitivity of the results um, uh, of the regimes uh, by the identified state variables, including and excluding temporary sales or uh, product substitutions or I use alternative monetary policy shocks that are identified recursively via Koleski type decomposition um, or through the narrative method a la Romer and Romer. I also analyze the sensitivity of the results concerning the model specification and the data choices. For example, I extend the, parsim the parsimonious model uh, to include additional variables such as financial variables, uh, I use alternative variables for measuring output and prices. I change lag orders or the model deterministics included in the model. Um, exclude the Great Recession or the, the pandemic and the post-pandemic period or estimate the whole model in quarterly data instead of uh, the monthly data. The baseline results turn out to be very robust to all of these uh, alternative identification schemes and uh, model specifications. This brings me to my conclusion. In this paper, I evaluated the nonlinear effects of monetary policy across states of price rigidity. I provided a micro foundation of the state dependent effects of monetary policy in the underlying price setting behavior of firms disciplined by micro price data. I found that I found evidence of nonlinearities in monetary policy across states of price rigidity. In particular, I find larger impulse responses of economic activity in periods of rigid price adjustment and larger impulse responses of prices in periods of flexible price adjustment. Compared with linear local projections, the effects of a monetary policy shock is amplified by a factor of up to three uh, for both variables in the nonlinear extension. 
Thus, linear estimates run the risk of considerably underestimating the differential effects of monetary policy, resulting from changes in price flexibility. And this calls for the greater consideration of nonlinearities in model of monetary policy transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Um, also here we have seen a very um, sort of state-of-the-art uh, use of uh, granular data and techniques. Uh, um, I have one question, just to make sure I understood uh, correctly. Um, so you show one chart uh, um, showing that the frequency of price adjustment is correlated with uh, the business cycle and uh, with inflation. Uh, so then uh, um, when you do uh, your uh, um, regressions, uh, can I equally say that uh, this different uh, response uh, is not due to frequency or price adjustment, but it's due to the business cycle or is due to the level of inflation? How do I know that you are just capturing correlation rather than causality? Mm -hmm. Well, to, to mitigate these concerns, I, I, uh, I, I presented these uh, endogeneity checks of, the, of this, the frequency as a state variable. So to make sure that, first of all, the frequency is not uh, af uh, affected by the monetary policy shocks when I identify these states. Oh, no, but even if it was, what I mean is that even if it's not affected, uh, it's more like the economic interpretation. It might be that it's not capturing uh, uh, change uh, the frequency, but it's capturing another thing, let's say uh, something driving the business cycle, so another source. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. So there, there, uh, there is this debate in the literature on the state-dependent effect of monetary policy uh, across business cycles, across inflation cycles. And I, I see these results probably more as, as an explanation of, uh, wha of why monetary policy has these differing effects during inflationary periods and during uh, business cycles, because the price, the underlying price setting behavior of the firms uh, changes. Thank you. Let's see if we have, uh, yes, Paolo. Thank you. So uh, this is maybe related to your point, uh, Roberto. So, um, when uh, uh, you have prices that are more rigid, that corresponds to periods of low inflation. You also have the lower bound binding. So how? Do you, did you think about how to disentangle also the presence of this other nonlinearity in the... In of, the of the lower bound uh, yeah. specifically, yeah. That's why I, um, the, the types of monetary policy shocks I use um, um, uh, are, are, are shocks that uh, capture unconventional measures. Um, so um, that, that, that helps particularly in that period. Um, so this, this is why I'm not uh, using just like in uh, shocks on interest rates, but also these unconventional measures um, to, to capture uh, the monetary policy shocks during these periods. We had also a question over there. Thanks a lot. Uh, cool data. Uh, I had one question on the, on the quantification. I mean, you show this range, you know, it's maybe between 10 and at the very end, 17%. So you say you have large variation, uh, but then you, and the results you get are quite big, if I understand correctly, the kind of the different differential results between states is times, times three or something. But think about somewhere like Argentina where prices reset, you know, once you get very high inflation, prices reset daily. Um, I mean, maybe you can't extrapolate, but I, I still wonder how, you know, how you kind of rationalize the large quantification, or maybe um, maybe I get it wrong now, but if you only split your sample into two states, let's say, the kind of delta in price setting is not enormous, right? You could get different situ economic environments where you get much bigger deltas. Would you have, you know, would you expect much bigger differences in the power of monetary policy? It's just kind of like a, a you know, first check on, on plausibility. Uh, good question. Um, I, I I've never thought about that. Uh, I I would think that yeah, like when uh, the 
the, the more extreme price the, these um, so, so in, in the UK it ranges between let's say 10 and 20 percent um, there are obviously countries where this uh, there are much more extreme differences in this frequency of price changes so I would imagine that also the um, the, the impact then in these these estimations would be bigger um, also like comparing these two states um, there, there is another end for, for in, in the euro era. Generally, pr price setting was much more f uh, flat during that period. It did, 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 did exhibit less variation than, than we saw here in the UK, which was one motivating reason to, to study the UK. Um, uh, yeah. What about Sushi? Thanks very much. That's super interesting. So, I, um, two questions. One was, it seems in your like super interesting chart that there might be some sort of slower moving trend in the data where prices are gradually getting more flexible, which would be consistent with online, you know, move to on, online uh, marketplaces and, and sales and so on over the 25 years of, of your sample. Um, so uh, have you looked at that? Does that, um, part, you know, do you need to detrend for that or, or does it, or can you get something interesting about looking at that lower frequency move? That was one thing. Second thing, did you look at the, uh, whether it's different for um, expansionary and contractionary monetary policy, because you know if you think about you know, price rigidities, you normally think about a downward nominal price rigidity, you know, being more of a constraint than the upwards, and, and and that would also, so maybe there's a difference between expansionary and contractionary monetary policy, or if not, that would be think interesting to to look into. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, to the to the to the first part. Um, uh, I agree. We saw that uh, we, we saw that more when we studied uh, actually Swiss CPI microdata. There, we we were able to identify online prices which were driving to some extent a trend in the frequency. Here in that data, I I was not uh, able to dig deeper in what types of prices really um, uh, are below that. And for for the estimation, the the frequency is detrended, um, so it it shouldn't may, uh, be a concern in in the estimation of the local projections. And uh, the second, uh, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I, I haven't done that, but I think it's a great idea to, uh, to disentangle these, uh, these two types of shocks to, uh, uh, to investigate these asymmetric effects. Thank you. So um, we are a bit also um, running um, out of time. And uh, so again, it shows a great interest in your paper. Uh, so let's uh, thank you, Pascal, and move uh, uh, Piotr. So you have 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is joint work with Yuting Chang at St. Louis Fed, so the usual disclaimer applies. Many micro policies affect aggregate outcomes through asset markets either by design or unintentionally. The policies that we have in mind are you know, conventional measures like monetary policy that works through changing interest rates, fiscal policy that often involves issuance of government debt, as well as more unconventional measures like asset purchase programs. Given the prominent, the important role that financial intermediaries play in those asset markets, it's natural to ask how they and their properties matter for the transmission of those policies. And one approach to answer that question would be to use one of the existing models with micro-founded financial frictions. But the problem is that there is a large variety of models with micro-founded financial frictions with deep parameters that are often not that easy to measure. Just think of Gertle Karadi Kiyotaki with an asset diversion rate, or maybe what's the cost of monitoring in costly state verification models. As a result, it's often not clear which features of those models are important for the transmission and how to quantify them. This paper is our attempt to address this issue. We built on a rather simple observation that financial intermediaries are in essence suppliers of assets. They take one form of assets such as loan, they transform this asset and supply assets to the rest of the economy in form of deposits. And to the extent that the policies that we want to study involve changes in quantities and prices, the details of micro foundations are not important. It's enough to know the shape of those supply curves. This is the standard thing that we do in, in introductory micro. We ask, given some change in prices, how quantities respond, given some changes in quantities, how prices respond. 
So our goal in this paper is to derive a set of sufficient statistics in terms of some observable objects that characterize the role that financial intermediaries play in transmission of those policies through asset markets. Our framework is quite general. It allows for households' heterogeneity and illiquidity, as well as frictional financial intermediation, nesting a large class of financial intermediation models. Households in our model are heterogeneous and they you know, prefer some assets that we label liquid assets. Intermediaries take illiquid capital and transform it into liquid assets, but they are subject to some frictions that limit the scope of this activity. In the context of our model, we showed that the elasticities of liquidity supply with respect to returns, rates of returns on various assets, are sufficient statistics that fully characterize the role the financial sector plays in transmission of those macro policies. We show that this is something that we can measure in the data and we'll make an attempt to do so in this paper using data for the US banking sector and some information about identified shocks like monetary policy shocks or oil price shocks. We then show quantitatively that those elasticities matter. So it's not only some theoretical curiosity, but we take one particular application and we study, given some amount of resources raised by issuing government debt, which policy, tax cuts or asset purchases, is more effective in stimulating aggregate output. We show that our standard you know, workhorse macro model generates predictions that differ both qualitatively and quantitatively by orders of magnitude. Why? It's only because of some implicit assumptions about those elasticities that are hidden in those models. Our estimates in turn show that you know, the financial sector is relatively elastic, indicating that tax cuts have relatively stronger effects. Okay, so let's go to the model. So time is discrete, there are all aggregate shocks, and we have a continuum of households indexed by I from zero to one that maximize utility they consume and they hold two types of assets, liquid B and illiquid A. Everything here, by the way, is real. And they do so subject to a standard budget constraint where you know, RA, that's the rate of return on illiquid assets, RB, that's the rate of return on liquid assets, and phi, is a function that captures the fact that A is meant to represent illiquid assets. So whenever households change their position of A, they might need to incur some costs. There is obviously also labor income and some taxation and borrowing constraints that you know, put a lower bound on the asset positions. Note that households here don't maximize with respect to labor. Labor will be chosen on behalf of those households by some labor union, which will be our way to introduce nominal rigidity in this model. The production side is quite standard. We have a Cobb Douglas production function with a representative price taking producer. Nothing fancy here. And we have nominal weight rigidity and capital adjustment costs. This capital adjustment cost gives us you know, capital price Q that's moves, that's not equal to one always. And we use RK to denote the rate of return on capital, which includes both the dividend yield as well as you know, capital gain due to changes in those capital prices. So now let's talk about the financial sector, which is the heart of our model. The financial sector is two-tiered. It consists of a passive mutual fund, as well as, uh, as, well as of a of an financial intermediary, which is you know, where the action actually is in this model. The mutual fund holds intermediary net worth, denoted by N, as well as some capital, the value of which is Q times KF. The rate of return on illiquid assets, because you know, illiquid assets is what this fund issues to finance its holdings of net worth and capital, is a value-weighted average return on intermediary net worth, Rn times N, and directly held capital, Rk, Qk, uh, Qkf. So that's the mutual fund. It's completely passive. It's not making any optimization. It will just follow a simple rule that we outlined below. So let's talk about the intermediary now. Financial intermediaries issue liquid assets, D tilde, and they use them together with net worth to hold capital, QTKB, and liquid government debt denoted by BB, 
we assume that liquid assets intermediated or issued by the financial intermediary as well as government debt are perfect substitutes, which means that we can keep track of you know, net liquidity supply of the financial sector denoted by D, which is simply a difference between liquid deposits D tilde and liquid assets held by the financial sector. And we model for intermediation frictions in a very reduced form way. So given some net worth N, the value of capital intermediated by the intermediary is some multiple of that net worth given by theta, where theta is a function that depends on the entire path of future returns on capital and returns that have to be paid on deposits, liquid assets issued by the financial sector. The path of our case denotes some investment, represents some investment opportunities of the financial sector, whereas RB denotes you know, costs of uh, doing all that intermediation because we need to pay on deposits and so on. Despite the simplicity, as I will show you very soon, this function theta will allow us to you know, capture various sorts of micro foundations behind financial frictions used in the literature. So the rate of return on net worth is just you know, leverage return leverage time spread plus rate of return on liquid assets. And we assume that net worth of the financial intermediary follows this process. Net worth next period is some function g of theta, this leverage or intermediary frictions, returns, and some constant inflow m. As we show in the paper, this net worth process allows us to capture some, you know, for example, optimal equity issuance choices used in the literature, as well as some linear loss of no, uh, linear exogenous uh, loss of motions for net worth. Right? So you can think that you know, this G plus M, that's something that fully describes what the mutual fund does. It just follows this rule. So the government in this model issues liquid debt, BG, collects taxes, purchases goods, as well as illiquid assets. For simplicity, we will assume that monetary policy sets the real rate directly, so there is no Taylor rule. We just you know, have a real rate peg for simplicity. And the equilibrium is standard, it's prices and allocations such that agents optimize and market clear, markets clear. In particular, the goods market in which you know, consumption plus adjustment costs plus goods used for investment by capital producers plus government purchases of goods, that has to be equal to output. There is also liquid asset market, which means that liquid asset holdings of households, that has to be equal to liquid assets supplied by the intermediary plus liquid government debt. And illiquid asset market says that illiquid assets held by the households plus illiquid assets held by the government, that has to be equal to illiquid assets issued by the mutual fund, which is just the sum of intermediary net worth and the value of capital held directly by the fund. So, before going to aggregate responses, we will first focus on the financial sector to understand the role of this theta function and how it interacts with the rest of the economy. Our first result is a nesting result that shows that despite the simplicity of the theta function, it actually allows us to nest a large class of models of financial intermediation with micro foundations ranging from, for example, asset diversion of Gertle, Karadi, Kiyotaki kind through costly state verification, as in Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist, some models of more reduced form frictions like costly leverage, as well as some models with collateral constraints. To be more precise, this means that, you know, take one of these models, and this model will give you some mapping between rates of return on capital and liquid assets and liquidity supply. You know, what, what those models have in common is that the financial sector takes the path of returns, the sequence of returns as an input, and gives us the path of liquidity supply as an output. And moreover, in those models, this theta function, which is you know, something that describes liquidity supply as a function of returns, has a particular nice structure around the steady state. It's parameterized only by three parameters, theta bar RK, theta bar RB, those are sensitivities that tell us how the theta function responds to changes in returns, expected returns one period ahead, as well as gamma, which is a parameter that controls the degree of forward-lookingness of the financial friction. 
Obviously, the values of those parameters will depend on the exact micro foundations that we use in those four models. For example, in asset diversions models of gertle karadik yotaki kind, all three parameters will be strictly positive. But on the other hand, theta bar rk and theta bar rb will be fully pinned down by the steady state of the model. So once you see some steady state leverage, you know the values of those uh, parameters. On the other hand, in costly state verification models, you have some extra degrees of freedom. So it's not enough to know some steady state levels of aggregates to determine the values of those functions. But at the same time, it comes at a cost because, for example, in those costly state verification models, gamma is set to be zero. So those models don't feature like, any degree of forward lookingness. So to characterize the role that the financial sector plays, we will use our theta function, combine it together with the law of motion for net worth to derive liquidity supply given returns that I will denote by this curly D. And we can calculate its elasticities. Right? We have this nice property that theta depends on three parameters. So together with some derivatives of the G function, we can calculate elasticities of liquidity supply with respect to returns around the steady state. That take into account both the fact that those financial frictions are forward looking, as well as network propagation through past shocks. Those elasticities, and here you see cross price elasticities with respect to rates of return on capital, uh, depend on the three parameters in an intuitive way. When those three parameters have larger values, those elasticities are larger. Why is this useful? Because it allows us to reduce the infinite dimensional object. You know, those intertemporal elasticities are infinitely dimensional and summarize it in terms of just few parameters that can potentially be measured in the data. We then use a uh, intertemporal supply and demand system to characterize equilibrium of this model. So given any path of policies, the equilibrium output and returns on capital have to satisfy this system of equations every period, where the two first equations that just goods market clearing condition and liquid asset market clearing condition, and the third is the accounting identity that linked the rate of return on illiquid assets with the rates of return on capital and rates of return on liquid assets. The key thing here is that the financial sector appears only through the D function, the liquidity supply function. The other functions that we see here, C, X, B, that represent consumption, investment, and liquid asset demand, are independent of any properties of the financial sector. So as you will see in the next slide, up to first order, it's derivative of the D function that will fully characterize the role the financial sector plays in the transmission of macro policies. So it contains all the information that we need to know about the financial sector. So we will do it in two steps. We will study you know, first order responses to macro policies around the steady state. And as a first step, we'll characterize what happens in the asset market. So I will take the asset, liquid asset market clearing condition I will define excess liquidity as a difference between liquidity supply, a sum from financial intermediaries and the government, net of liquidity demand of households. And I can show that in equilibrium, returns on capital satisfy this equation. So there are some shifts in liquidity, in excess liquidity, for example, due to issuance of government debt. And the response of rates of return on capital will depend inversely on the key object, the matrix epsilon RK, which denotes you know, sensitivity of excess liquidity with respect to returns of capital. So let's go through some examples to like, illustrate the workings of this mechanism. So let's first focus on a simple case in which liquidity demand from households is perfectly inelastic and moreover, the financial sector is not forward looking, there is no propagation of net worth, it's completely static. In this simple environment, the size of changes in the rate of return on capital will depend only on the size of the shift in excess liquidity and on the parameter theta RK, which is sensitivity of the theta function with respect to rates of return on capital. In this case, you know, it's fully determined by theta bar RK. A second case is the one in which we have perfectly elastic liquidity supply, which means that the two parameters, theta bar RK and theta bar RB, go to infinity. 
This is what's implicitly assumed in the intertemporal Keynesian cross paper by Euclid, Rogni, and Straub. In this case, you can see that anything that comes from the household is irrelevant. And monetary policy, by controlling the rate of return on liquid assets, can perfectly control the rate of return on capital. For example, government debt, that will play no role. Changes in taxes, that will play no role. As a third case, consider, you know, an extreme case in which B, liquidity demand, is perfectly elastic. So that's, for example, when liquid and illiquid assets are perfect substitutes, in which case they are not really liquid nor illiquid, it's just one asset. Here, you know, the size of responses of returns on capital will depend only on the properties of the household sector. The financial sector will be irrelevant here. And this is, you know, another extreme assumption, but it's actually what's assumed in the kaplan morviolante to asset Hank model. There is no endogenous response of the financial sector. All in all, you can see that, you know, it's both the household side and the financial intermediation that pins down the size of the entries of the epsilon RK matrix. But, but as I will show you later in our you know, quantitative example, the sensitivities of the household side are very small, so we are closer to the first case. And it will be the sensitivities of the financial sector that will be largely important for determining the size of responses of the rate of return on capital. So having characterized the responses in the asset market, we can define aggregate demand as a sum of consumption you know, plus those adjustment costs, plus goods used for investment purposes, plus government purchases. And we can characterize aggregate output responses to macro policies. There are three channels. The first channel is a goods market channel. It's a standard channel. It's easiest to understand it when we, for example, consider an increase in government purchases. Government purchases directly increase aggregate demand. So that's the you know, standard, standard story. The new part is the asset market channel, which is linked to what I discussed in the previous slide. Whenever, for example, there is a change in government debt, that induces a shift in, liquid, uh, in excess liquidity in the asset market. And that will trigger some responses in the rate of return on capital, the size of which depends on the properties of the theta function of the financial intermediary. This, in turn, will affect aggregate demand, right? For example, there is some adjustment in rates of return on capital, and that leads to changes in capital prices. When the financial sector is inelastic, the responses of RK will be larger, so they will induce larger responses of capital prices, and that will affect investment. So that's the second channel, the asset market channel with matrix omega that consists of the response of aggregate demand to returns on capital times you know, this matrix epsilon RK, which told us by how much returns on capital respond to shifts in excess liquidity in the asset market. And finally, there is a modified Keynesian cross, which is just your regular Keynesian cross with a twist. Whenever there is any change in aggregate income, that also triggers some shifts in excess liquidity. For example, people have more income, they want to absorb more liquid assets. And that will again induce some change in returns on capital, which you know, triggers the asset market channel again. So now we want to pin down the three key parameters, those two theta bars and gamma, to understand how it actually matters you know, quantitatively. So what we do, we use data on the US banking sector. Our empirical specification is just you know, a version of the theta function linearized, where we calculate effective leverage of the US banking sector. We use yield curves as some measures of those expected returns. And obviously, there is a question of endogeneity. So we have two identification strategies. The first one is just Let's pretend that this upsilon is just some measurement error, so there are no exogenous shifts in the banking sector leverage, which might seem like a very restrictive assumption, but please keep in mind that we still allow for shifts in liquidity supply due to, for example, some network destruction or things like that. And our second identification uh, strategy is to run a VAR that has all those yields plus some shock proxies for monetary shocks, oil shocks, 
and intermediary network shocks and the identifying, uh, identifying, identifying assumption will be that it's only those, that those proxies respond contemporaneously only to some structural oil, monetary and intermediary network shocks. And then we ex do historical decomposition and extract variation in yields that are generated by those free structural shocks and we use that as our you know, instrument. So our results are here. We can see that the size of those cross price elasticities is, is around 25. Standard errors are quite large. But what we can say for sure, it's neither zero nor infinity. It's around 25. And there is a large forward looking component, close to one, denoting that you know, the financial sector seems to be quite forward looking. Let's contrast it with the implicit assumptions in macro models. For example, in the GKK framework, as I said earlier, we can just take the steady state leverage and returns and calculate those elasticities. They are around one half. You know, it's like the lower bound of our confidence intervals. In the perfectly elastic case, the IKC paper, infinity, in a two asset Hank model by Kaplan Morvillante, it's zero. So we are kind of in between and perhaps slightly above those GKK implied elasticities. We take a standard net worth process that's used in the literature with standard parameterization. We calibrate the household side, matching you know, a variety of moments. And as you can see here, demand elasticities are, mar are much, much lower than supply elasticities. So it's largely the financial sector that shapes the epsilon function. Right? This is consistent with some evidence from recent studies by Gebex and so on. So it will be mostly you know, the financial sector, given that we have those low elasticities for the household sector, that will shape the size of the asset market responses. So now we go to our policy experiment, which you know, is close to Main Street versus Wall Street debate. There is government that issues some amount of government debt, and it can use the resources in two ways. Way number one is to purchase illiquid assets. Way number two is to cut taxes for everyone. You can see the paths of policies here. And without loss of generality, we will keep the path of real interest rates and government purchases at the steady state. Like, as, as long as they are the same in both experiments, it will not matter. So here the final slide that shows you know, the effects of those policies for a range of models. So what I plot here is a difference between output responses under asset purchases and tax cuts. So positive values mean that asset purchases have larger output responses, negative values that tax cuts have larger responses. The blue line, you know, the one at the top, that's a perfectly inelastic case. kaplan mill violante with zero elasticity of liquidity supply. The red one is perfectly elastic, that's the IKC paper. Sorry, the, the black one. The red one, that's our empirical estimates. And those yellow-orange lines, those are you know, versions of GKK in which we move the elasticities from the value of 12 to 25. So, you know, time's up, so let's conclude. We provide a framework to study how the financial sector affects transmission of macro policies and how it interacts with households. We characterize, you know, in terms of sufficient statistics, which are the elasticities of liquidity supply, and we do this policy comparison exercise in which we show that those elasticities indeed matter a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Piotr. Um, so let's open uh, the floor. Thank you. It was very intriguing. Uh, there is a uh, asset manager in the UK and his name is Michael Howell and he has uh, a sort of a hedge fund called uh, Cross Border Capital and he has been talking for years and years about the importance of liquidity and the supply of liquidity for asset markets but the answer he always got is that there was no theory behind why liquidity really had to matter for asset prices on, uh, or for the economy. I think, you know, this is the first time I see a formal model that I think actually speaks to his uh, uh, sort of market guidance. The question I had uh, was um, whether this uh, kind of framework can be used to understand the interaction between, for example, the effects on the economy or on the one hand, 
the central bank doing quantitative tightening, and uh, the other hand, for example, the government doing, uh, doing uh, for example, fiscal expansion, which is a big question that is not only for seeking a policy, but for example, also for the calibration of the, uh, of the uh, central bank balance sheet. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I will respond to this one first. Okay? Yes, yes, please. So first of all, thanks for saying that it's the first fury, it's not the first one. So same as Eau Claire et al, you know, like resurrected Keynesian cross. This is ISLM in some way, because we have two equations. One is a you know, goods market, another is some liquidity market. And going back to your second question, or actually, that was the question. So, uh, you know, the weakness here is that we assume that government debt and other liquid assets are perfect substitutes, but it's easy to extend this framework. And then you can use it to study the sorts of questions that you had in mind. In fact, we are you know, working on a follow-up paper that extends the number of assets to whatever you want. So it's like very general in that case. Over there. Um, one question about the expected returns. So you are using treasury yields as expected returns? Yes, we use treasury yields. Yeah, ideally you would probably want to use a term premium or something, I guess, because of the expected short rate path. Yes, yeah. so we use you know, treasury yields for those RBs, and for our case we use high uh, quality market adjusted to be close to BAA, because we think that's like a better measure of returns on capital. So, uh, yeah, we, let's close here and uh, the conversation uh, can continue um, during the reception of our dinner. But first, let me thank uh, uh, our three presenters, uh, Lavinia, Pascal, and Piotr. And you are sort of a young economist, uh, so thanks. Uh, it was really a pleasure uh, to listen to you. So this closes uh, the, say, the formal part of uh, today's conference. Uh, we will reconvene tomorrow at nine here. And uh, so let me thank all the presenters, uh, uh, discuss some participants uh, in the room and also online today. And uh, now uh, we will uh, sort of slowly move uh, uh, into the um, dining room. Uh, so we will meet at 6 o'clock uh, in the foyer uh, outside the dining room uh, for uh, um, a drink and uh, then we will have dinner. And outside the room there will be some colleagues uh, um, helping uh, uh, who doesn't know where to go. And so see you tomorrow.